You may wish to adjust the dial. You're currently tuned into the wrong station. I've always loved train stations at night. Transit train stations, I mean. I've never been in the other kind, where you board trains for other cities. Not a lot of those in Western Canada. I'm sure they're great too. Or maybe not. Maybe they're just like airports, which have their own kind of magic, I guess. Step into this big metal tube, sit down, have a nap, boom, you're in another city. Transit stations are more everyday magic. Step into this big metal tube, zone out for 20 minutes, boom, you're home. Or a few minutes walk away, in my case. I work the late shift at the bar, but I'm almost always off in time to take the train home. The nights that I'm not, I have to take a night bus. Don't love buses, day or night. I don't know exactly why I like taking the train at night, but not the bus. Probably because I get on the train in a big, well-lit, empty station, but I have to catch the bus on the dark street. My manager, Kylie, often asks why I don't work closer to home. I live near the downtown core. No shortage of bars there. But I like my job. Every time I hear of a bartending job somewhere I could walk to, something there feels off. There's a lecherous boss or a filthy bathroom or just weird vibes from the clientele. I never believed in vibes in a new-agey way, but everywhere's got a tone. The bar I work at, the Bell and Whistle, it's got a good tone. I like Kylie, I like our regulars, and I even like my midnight commute home. Cities at night are beautiful, especially viewed from an elevated train. I was waiting in an empty station around midnight for the SkyTrain to come. Maybe if I lived in a high crime area, that would be a frightening statement. But I don't. Vancouver, the parts of it I frequent, is a fairly safe city. I've always felt safe here. In a city, you're either safe because there are people around, or you're safe because there aren't. I've never had a serious problem, just the occasional cat caller or a guy who stares, but nothing horrible ever came of it. I get more trouble dealing with handsy or belligerent drunks at the bar. And statistically speaking, most female victims of violence are harmed by men they know, not strangers. Which is why when I first saw the man enter the station, I wasn't worried for myself. I was worried for him because he was walking along the track. I just missed a train. I could see it pull away while I was still on the escalator coming up to the platform. Fucking hate it when that happens. Knowing if I'd just left work a minute earlier, or walked a little faster, or hadn't stopped to make sure Daryl, one of our regulars, had remembered to call his wife to pick him up and wasn't waiting in the cold for a ride that wasn't coming, I'd be on that long bullet of light and warmth, hurtling towards home, rather than waiting in the cold myself for the next train which should come in 10 minutes. Not too long a wait, but still. No good deed goes unpunished. I stepped onto the platform just in time to see the train I'd missed disappear into the snowfall that had been wetting the streets for the last 20 minutes, and sat down on one of the benches to wait for the next one. Despite the snow, the night wasn't that cold, but the same can't be said for the station's metal benches, so I perched on the edge. Normally, I'd have pulled out my phone to mindlessly scroll through the tweets of West Coast night owls and newly awakened Brits, but my battery was low enough for me not to want to risk it dying on me by going online. Like I said, I've never been assaulted or robbed, but a woman making her way home alone in the dark should always have a working phone. That's just common sense. My phone is only three years old and can barely hold a charge anymore. Planned obsolescence. I watched as the train came from the other direction and briefly stopped at the deserted opposite platform. I could see a few people on it, but no one got off. 
The station became very still after it sped off. The only movement was the eddies of snow that would drift in from the openings at either end and immediately melt when they landed on the platform or tracks. It was quiet, and more than a little lovely. There's a word, I think it was only coined in the last ten years or so, for the eerie atmosphere of a place that is usually bustling and is now abandoned. I tried to remember it as I watched the snow, but it escaped me. I didn't want to look it up. <laughs> Lately, just turning on the mobile data would drain my battery by 5%. I really didn't want to buy a new phone yet. It's so goddamn expensive and wasteful, but I was starting to think I couldn't put it off much longer. Since the beauty of a forlorn midnight snowfall can only hold my interest for a minute or two, I was passing the remaining time trying to decipher the heavily graffitied advertisement on the wall of the opposite platform. A school for pirates? That couldn't be right. When I saw something moving out of the corner of my eye. I looked down the track, expecting to see my train arriving, though one wasn't scheduled to come for another eight minutes. Instead, I saw a man walking on the track, coming from the same direction my train would. He wasn't wearing a visibility vest like a transit worker would be wearing, especially if they were walking the track at night. And he wasn't walking on the slightly raised walking platform that twins the track, like any human in their right mind who found themselves walking on an elevated train track would. He was walking on the track itself, a track that, before it entered the station, was at least two stories up in the air. I was at the other end of the platform, so it took him maybe ten seconds to get close enough for me to make out his clothes and features. He was a nondescript white man with short brown hair, maybe in his thirties, clean-shaven. He was slim, wearing a fitted black suit with a white button-up shirt and loosely knotted skinny black tie. I could hear his large black boots, incongruous with the rest of his outfit. I think they're called engineer boots? Scrape against the rail ties as he got closer. Everything okay? I asked him as he passed me. I thought he didn't hear me because it took him three or four seconds to respond by looking at me. By that time, he'd already walked past me, so when he looked at me, he had to turn his head. He kept walking in a straight line down the track while he looked over his shoulder at me. His eyes were dark, shadowed from the harsh overhead lighting that made his skin seem very pale. There was no expression on that pallid face, no menace or fear or confusion or terrible purpose. I couldn't see anything in that blank face. I stared into the dark pools where his eyes must have been as he walked away from me. Just when I was afraid his head was going to keep twisting back in a way no human neck could, his head swiveled forward. As he'd done the whole time, he kept walking. Soon he passed the blue light at the end of the platform and disappeared into the swirling, snowy darkness outside of the station. I looked around. I was alone on the platform. No stranger for me to shrug at to say... Did you see that, too? No one to have a little chuckle with at the absurd strangeness that had just walked in and out of the station. The only sound was the now rising wind and the continuous mechanical chug of the escalator behind me. I felt rooted to the spot. I didn't know what to do. Call the police? And tell them what? That a man was walking on the track? They'd never reach here in time to stop the next train from hitting him if he was still on the track when it came, and even if they did... The man might be suffering from some kind of suicidal urge or something. Getting the police involved in that kind of situation usually only makes things worse. I looked up at the security cameras, wondering if maybe I should wave my arms to get the attention of whoever was manning the monitors, assuming anyone even was. Then I spotted the emergency phone on the platform, the one you're supposed to use when there's a medical issue or a mechanical problem or a crime. I didn't know if this qualified as any of those, but since the next train was due in six minutes, it soon would. As I picked up the phone and held it to my ear, I realized my hair was damp. I was certain the man's hair had been dry. My own was still a little bit wet from the snow that had fallen on me during my short, hatless walk to the station. There was no dial pad on the phone. Hello? I said. I heard windy static, followed by a clicking sound, like another handset on the open line had been picked up. Hello, this is Jane. Do you need to report an emergency? Said a pleasant, professional voice. It's not... 
Uh, I don't know if it's an emergency. There's a man on the track. Someone's fallen onto the track? No, I mean, I, I don't know if he fell on them, but he's walking. He, he was just walking down the track. Not the safe walkway beside the track. He was on the track itself. The voice was silent. I heard the wind on the line pick up even more and thought maybe we'd been cut off when she said, Do you still see him? No, he walked right past me out of the station. I asked if he needed help. You spoke to him? She said, her alarmed tone jarring me. Yeah, I asked if he was okay. He heard me, I'm sure, because he turned his head to look at me. At least, I think he was looking at me, but he didn't say anything. He just kept walking. Oh, that's probably fine, she said, with a level of relief that made me even more nervous. When is the next train coming? I looked up at the digital display. Three minutes. Okay, when the train comes, I want you to look through the windows of the car, make sure it's properly lit, and that there's no one on the train, and then get on. No, you don't understand, I said, worried I hadn't explained myself properly. The guy was walking on the track. When the next train comes and then leaves the station, if he's still on the track, it'll hit him. I understand everything you've told me. Now, it's important that you don't tell me your name. What? I said. I had the disorienting feeling that the conversation had skipped ahead a few minutes without me realizing it. I will refer to you as Jane. Isn't your name Jane? It, you can have my name. It, it's not an issue for me, I said, wondering if they got a lot of callers who preferred to stay anonymous. No, you need to keep your name. I didn't understand what that meant, but it disturbed me. Jane, she said. When the next train comes, you will check to make sure it's normal, and then you will get on it. Normal? But the man, Jane, we are aware of the walker. The train won't hurt him. They never do. What? What does that mean? I said again. A and what did you mean make sure the next train is normal? Why wouldn't it be normal? How could a train be abnormal? Wait for the next train. And stay on the line with me while you wait. It's important that you stay on the line. It's safer. Safer how? I is this guy dangerous? I'd been looking in the direction the man had gone while we talked, but now I started looking both ways so he couldn't find a way to sneak around me. The station was well lit, and there was nothing he could hide behind. As long as I kept looking both ways down the platform, I'd see him coming. We've dealt with this situation before. It's important that you follow my instructions. I looked up at the security cameras. C can you see me on the cameras? Y you must have access to those feeds. Those don't work where you are now. No one can see you, she said. For the first time in my life, I was fully aware of how much a sense of security, however false, surveillance cameras gave me when I was alone in empty places like the train station. I looked from the cameras to the digital display, which thankfully said the next train was arriving now. I saw the train's lights piercing the dark and the snow as it moved towards the station, and the feeling of relief almost made my knees weak. The train was here. I would get on it, and it would take me out of this fucked up situation, and possibly kill that weird guy walking on the track, but at this point I considered that his problem. The sound of the train's arrival filled the station, like breath through a giant woodwind instrument that became a low mechanical rumble. It was music to my ears. I see the train. I said. Good. Stay on the line until it's in front of you. The doors have opened, and you can see inside the car. When the train slowed to a stop in front of me, I finally understood what an abnormal train looked like. I have a feeling that if I just glanced at the train, like if it was passing above my head while I was on the street, I wouldn't have noticed anything was wrong. But staring at it while it squatted at the platform... It was clear this wasn't a normal train. It was only later that I remembered the warning about staring into abysses. In my defense, it never occurred to me until that moment that a train could contain an abyss. The train was dark. The only lights on it were the headlights, and it was far too long. Rather than three or four usual cars, there were at least a dozen. Too long to fit entirely in the station, the back cars trailed off into the darkness outside. Like the walker, it wasn't wet from the snow. It was dry and dusty. The doors opened with a loud and grinding whoosh, 
enveloping me in a spicy, metallic smell that made me gag when I first smelled it, and only got stronger as the train waited on the platform. I couldn't see inside any of the cars very well. The windows were so dirty, and the station lights didn't penetrate as far as they should have into the open doors. Despite this, I thought I could sense movement inside the car in front of me. Slow, amorphous movement in the dark. Or maybe the dark itself was moving. I cupped the phone with my hand. My mouth was so dry I could barely speak. It's not a normal train, I whispered. That's okay. Just stay on the line with me. Let it go. It's important that you let it go. Another one will be along soon, Jane said calmly. Another train like this? I pictured a long line of dry, dusty trains crouching just outside the station in the snow, waiting for their turn to get inside, to present themselves to me. No, a normal one. The doors of the car in front of me remained open far too long, much longer than train doors normally do. I kept waiting for one of the things I sensed moving inside to emerge, a tentacle or a floating wraith or a blob of animated darkness that would seize me and drag me inside. Nothing did. The dust that caked the windows had clean streaks, which I knew hadn't been caused by the snow. Though the smell coming from the inside was thick and moist, the outside of the train was bone dry, as though all the cars had been kept in an abandoned garage or barn, or a grave dug so deep underground the heat of the earth baked the dust onto the windows. The clean streaks were symbols scratched into the window dust. Symbols which hurt my eyes when I looked at them head on and danced in my peripheral vision when I was able to pull my focus away and look down at the train's shadow bleeding onto the concrete of the platform. I gripped the phone so hard my hands went numb as I concentrated on standing perfectly still while not screaming. Eventually, the doors of all the cars closed with another whoosh, this one disturbingly wet and organic. The train silently pulled out of the station. As it left, I could see that it was longer than I thought, pulling dozens of cars. They were all filthy, but even through the dust-caked windows, I could see that the last car was lit up with a sickly, somehow sticky yellow light. By the time that car passed me, the train was moving too fast for me to tell what was going on inside. I'm very thankful for that. Jane, are you still there? Jane asked. I don't know, I said. When the last car was no longer visible to me from where I was standing, I slumped to my knees, still holding the phone with both hands. I felt comforted by the cold I could feel seeping through my jeans from the concrete. It was slightly painful, but it hurt in a very mundane way. You need to know if you're still there, Jane. It's important that you know. I'm still here. When is the next train arriving? She asked. I looked at the display. It flickered, the orange electric letters bleeding into one another and back again. It says it's going to be here always, I said. I bit my lip to stop from laughing or crying. If I started doing either one, I wouldn't be able to stop. That's a new one, she said chuckling softly. Hold on, I'll check for you. I heard her typing through the phone, a loud clacking like a typewriter rather than a computer keyboard. The next train is arriving in five minutes. You'll check it and get on if it's normal. Everything will be fine. It's important that you stay on the line. What is happening, I said. Why is this happening to me? It's important that you don't think about it. Try not to pay attention to the why. It doesn't matter and it won't help. Everything will be fine. I wanted to close my eyes and curl into a safe little ball, but terrified of something sneaking up behind me, I forced myself to continue to look up and down the platform. Everything was still. Everything appeared normal. The bright station lights still shone steadily. I thought about what it would have been like if the lights had gone out while the train was here, and felt my heart stutter at the idea. The digital display stopped flickering, and now said that the next train was two minutes away. The snowy wind blowing through the station had cleared out the damp metallic smell. The air was cold and clean. I breathed it in. A sudden calmness spread over me, like those moments in dreams when I know I'm going to die, and there's nothing I can do about it, so I just accept it. 
I stood up and dusted off my knees. I just remembered a word I couldn't remember before. It's canopsia, I said. I heard more clicking. I'm not familiar with that word. Then, with alarm, she said, Did you just make it up? No, it's not my word. It means the strange feeling you get in abandoned places. It's important you avoid abandoned places in the future, Jane. They're not safe for you now. What does that mean? It doesn't matter. Uh Uh-huh, I said. My calmness began to feel profoundly unnatural to me. I wondered if the metallic smell had really dissipated, or if it was still surrounding me and I'd just stop being able to smell it. So, how often does this happen? I really can't say. It's best we don't continue talking unless it's pertinent to your immediate safety. I mimed locking my lips and throwing away the key. Then considered telling her that I was miming locking my lips, but since that would defeat the purpose, I said nothing. I looked down the platform. I could see the lights of the next train. Trains are coming, I said. Okay, Jane, you know what to do. Everything will be fine. Stay on the line. All the cars of this train were lit. I could see that much as it slowed and entered the station. There were four cars. The windows were wet from the snow, and as clean as transit train car windows usually are. It stopped in front of me. The doors opened. The car beside the one directly in front of me had two passengers, a young couple, holding hands and talking. There are people in one of the cars, I said. If they look normal, it's fine. But to be on the safe side, get in another car. Hurry, she said, before it leaves. I tried to run to the train while still holding the phone handset. When the strong metal cord had stretched as much as it could, it halted my forward movement and I almost fell. I painfully uncurled my clenched hands, dropped the phone, and stumbled into the empty car. It looked like every other train car I've ever ridden in. Slightly worn, slightly dirty, utterly normal. I jumped and almost screamed when the doors closed behind me with their usual hiss. I didn't sit down. As normal as the car looked, I didn't want to touch anything. I stood in the middle of the car and balanced my weight like a surfer as it sped up and slowed down and went over the curves in the track. When I had to grab the pole to keep from falling, I held onto it through my sleeve so my skin didn't touch the metal. I thought the city seemed darker than it usually did, but that could have just been my imagination. I stared at my reflection in the window. My eyes looked dark, like the track walkers. I read a poem slotted amongst the advertisements along the top of the car. It was about a dead otter, I'd read it before, on a bus, so I knew it was as normal as a transit poem about a dead otter could be. I promised myself I'd look into buying a car the next day, and finding a job I could walk to, and getting a new phone with a giant battery that I could stare at all day long so I wouldn't be able to see anything going on around me. I got off at the station before my usual stop. It was an extra 20-minute walk to get home from there, but I didn't mind. This train seemed normal but I didn't want it to know where I lived. The streets were mostly empty. Vancouverites aren't known for their love of spending time in the cold or the snow. But there were still some pedestrians and cars here and there. The usual amount of activity for this time of night. Enough to make me feel like I was part of the ordinary world again. When I got back to my apartment, I took the stairs, obviously not the elevator. I locked my door, then pushed the bureau I keep in my front hallway for hats and scarves in front of it. I turned on all my lights and looked in all my closets and cupboards, leaving their doors open to the light when I was done. I stripped off my clothes. They smelled faintly of wet metal. I put them in a garbage bag, then dropped the bag out of my window. I had a long, hot shower, soaking my bathroom floor in the process because I couldn't stand the thought of closing the shower curtain. When I got out of the shower, I put on a pair of soft pajamas and took two shots of vodka and a Percocet. Just as I was about to fall asleep on my couch with all the lights blazing, my cell phone rang with a whooshing ringtone I'd never programmed. Hello, I said. I heard a noise outside my door, the shuffle of heavy boots, the smell of metal and spices and dust filled my apartment. 
Hello, Jane, Jane said. She was out of breath, and it sounded like she was running. Everything will be fine. It's important you stay on the line. That's when my phone died. The Wrong Station is made possible with the generous support of our listeners on Patreon. Patrons can listen to The Wrong Station ad-free, as well as get access to bonus episodes, discussions, and more. This week's episode, The Line, was written by Mary Gillis and performed by Rachel Hart. Thank you to Michael Osborne, Samantha Fallen, Bob Geslinger, Matt Puthers, Blood Mulch, Garrett McDonald, Benjamin Corey, Janelle Cocroft, and Jasper Hulme for helping us keep the lights, well, off. The Wrong Station is co-produced by Alexander Saxton, Anthony Botello, and Jacob Duarte Spiel, with music composed and performed on the piano by Elan Citrin, and arranged for the viola and performed by Viola Schmidt. You can follow The Wrong Station on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and email us at therongstation at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>